Okay. Was that the signal? Oh. <laughs> uh, well, good evening. I guess we'll just open tonight in uh, just a word of prayer, and then we'll just get into the program. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you, God, for who you are, Lord, for your truth, and for how great and mighty you are, Lord. And we come before you humbly, and we just ask that you speak to us tonight, and that you give us courage, Lord, that we uh, would you would spark a fire within us, Lord, tonight as we leave here, and we would just be refreshed and renewed and encouraged and built up, Lord, with a, uh, a new sense of duty and a new sense of purpose that you've called us to, God. I pray as we leave here tonight, Lord, that we uh, know you more and that we become more like you, God. We leave different than the way we came. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we start, I want to I want to ask a question. How would you react if, let's say, through our front doors walked a tremendous, impactful figure of history? Let's say William Shakespeare, right? He comes walking through this, the door. How would we react? Now, this person is, so, is someone who is responsible for, you know, most of Western civilization literature is, is on his, his shoulders. He walked through the door, or, or let's say Isaac Newton, or Abraham Lincoln, or wh whatever great tremendous figure of history that, that's shaped things, not just famous, but has actually shaped society around them. Right, Plato, Aristotle, uh, Tolstoy, uh, th these literary phenomenons and, and giants of history. How would you react if, if they walked and maybe and formed a line <laughs> right here? I think most of us, rightfully so, would get up out of our seats and, and run over to them and, and talk to them, shake their hands, try to like pick their minds, you know, what made you do what you did, how did you accomplish what you did, and, and just engage in an exciting way, right? We'd all be, our drugs would hit the floor, and, and like, wow, this is Abraham Lincoln, this, this is him. Now, what would happen if Jesus Christ walked through, and he was the last person in the line? I think that a lot of us, would, un unfortunately, a lot of people in church would probably have the same reaction. Go up to him like, wow, it's, it's Jesus. And I say unfortunately because the only proper reaction to that would for us to bow down before him. See, that, that's what we should do. If Jesus walked, there's a line of these great figures of history, like Galileo, all, all these people. And then Jesus, one is not like the others. Right? There's one who is high and lifted up above all of them, who is the name above all names. There's one who's the king of glory. And the only proper response to him would be to bow down prostrate before him in worship and adoration. But why is it that I, and oftentimes we, we view Christ as a great figure of history, purely, and he was, right, <laughs> what he's accomplished, but purely as a great figure of history. You know, we call him God, we call him uh, our Savior and all this stuff, but in our minds, I, I, I hear it in our, in our prayers, in, in our speech, the way we talk about him, as if we would talk about somebody else. The difference, and it's the thing that I think we really need to remember and, and to go back to, the difference is that he is holy. Holiness is a, it's purely an attribute of God that we know nothing about. See, holiness is purely from God. We can look at other attributes of God, like love, and because we're created in his image, we can share in God's attributes, right? We know what, what a love looks like, like a, a parent to a child. We know that. That comes from God. That's universal. It's because we're created in his image and his likeness that we can share in his attributes. We know what forgiveness looks like. We know what these other attributes of God looks like, except holiness. See, holiness is the one thing that in heaven, God is worshipped for above anything. And we'll see, you know, the angels saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Not love, 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 or mercy, 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 or grace, grace, grace. It's holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, is the Lord God Almighty. And because of that, he is worthy to be praised. So I'm going to bring up the definition of what holy is. 
And we're going to see how this is only, can only be claimed by God. The definition reads properly, whole, entirely, entire or perfect in a moral sense. Hence, pure in heart, temper or dispositions. Free from sin and sinful affections. And it's applied to the supreme being, God. Holy signifies perfectly pure, immaculate, and complete in moral character. See, now, when we use the term holy, what we'll define as a simple definition is set apart, right? It's something that's set apart. But it's an incomplete definition, although it's true. It's just incomplete, because if you're baking, right, if, you, if you're not a baker, you're not a cook, you have the ingredients, you have the wet ingredients, and then you separate that from the dry ingredients, that's not making it holy, not making the dry ingredients holy from the wet ingredients. That it is setting apart, but it's more than that. See, it has to do with character. It has to do with disposition, with who you are. That is what makes holy. And it's only from God because God is perfect. God is the only being that is perfect. And we are not. We're sinners, right? Because of our flesh, because of our sin, sinful nature, or human nature. And so God is set apart in that sense from, from everything. That's why he's the supreme. He is the holiest. Now God declares things holy. Right? They, God declares the nation of Israel holy from the other nations, sanctified from the other nations. And that's what God declares something to be. And so it's holy by his declaration because he is holy and he declares something holy. And he's called us holy in Christ. He's declared us, he, he's given us the spirit, his Holy Spirit, right? Declaring us holy. But that is something that's his and his alone, right? There's nothing here, nothing in us, nothing in this world that is holy, but what God declares it to be because he ultimately is holy. And so what we want to, what the goal is for tonight, this chapter, is to understand this attribute of God, that he is worshiped above everything else, because what I've seen the trend being for now genera like, generations before I was born is we have brought God down to our level. We brought Christ down to our level. And, and it's really a really interesting experiment that you can do maybe if you, if you have family or whatever. You know those personality tests that they have? Where it's, you know, you're this, you know, you're on this side of the spectrum or whatever. And you have all these personality tests. Do that. Have a whole family or a whole youth group. It would be great or whatever. Everyone do that, but do it as if you were Jesus filling this out, right? Fill out, answer all the questions as if you were Jesus, and then compare, and everyone does that. Everyone fills it out as if they were Jesus, and then compare. What you will find, undoubtedly, is that Jesus looks a lot like you. <laughs> you fill this out, and you, and, and you fill out your own, and then you compare them, and like, oh, wait, Jesus looks a lot like, like me and my personality, <laughs> what I would think, what I would do. And then that person, again, will do the same, have the same conclusion. Hey, Jesus looks a lot like, like me. But you'll notice that they all look different. The reason is, is because we don't know holiness. See, we say, what would Jesus do? Right, that was the big phrase back then. What would Jesus do? Turns out Jesus would do exactly what I would do. In every, in every situation, I said, what would Jesus do? Well, clearly, he would do this, because I would do that, Right? And so we bring God down, we bring Christ down to our level because we have no understanding of what a holy God is. I mean, in, in a different sense, it's almost like the Greek pantheon or the Roman pantheon where these gods, lowercase g, really all there are is humans that are just an extreme. They're, they're, they're human. They, they have all the human qualities, all the human attributes, but just with extra powers. They have arguments. They're, they're, they have sin in them. They have gel the rivalry and all this kind of stuff. If you actually read any of the mythologies of Greek and Romans and all this stuff, they're just humans with extra attributes, right? And in a similar sense, we brought God down to a human level because what do the Greeks know about holiness? Nothing. What do the Romans know about holiness? Nothing. But God is a holy God, and when we remove that attribute from him, he becomes nothing more than what we make of him. And, and if there's anything that's really affected the church, it's that, in my opinion. It's that. It's the removal of God's holiness. and say, God's just like 
our friend. He's just like, you know, a father figure. He's just like, which those things aren't wrong in the number of themselves, but you're removing the most important, the most worshipped quality of God that is his and his alone. His holiness. So we're going to read this chapter, and again, point, my, my hope is by the end of the night that we'll not only have a refreshing and, and more correct understanding of who God is, but that understanding is going to affect the way we pray. That understanding is going to affect the way that we worship as we talked just, just before this, that's going to affect the way that we read the scripture. That's going to affect the way we evangelize. That's going to affect the way we treat each other as brothers and sisters and treat the world. Is this understanding, this, this reclaiming and re, re understa- uh, reclaiming the knowledge of, of God's holiness. So let's read chapter 6. And, and as is tradition as with me, as I always like to read the entire chapter, and then we go back to the beginning. To discuss okay so chapter 6 verse 1 in Isaiah it reads in the year that King Isaiah died I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up and the train or the hem of his robe filled the temple above him stood the seraphim each had six wings with two he covered his face with two he covered his feet and with two he flew And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man with unclean lips, and I dwell amidst a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal they had taken from the tongs, uh, with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sins atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, Lord, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull or fat, and their eyes and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until the cities lie waste, without inhabitant, and the houses without people, and the land is desolate is a desolate waste and the Lord removes the people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land and though a tenth remain in it it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains and when it is felled and the holy seed is its stump all right so this is uh, some people say that this is actually the beginning of his ministry. It says in the year that Uzziah died, and, and it's the vision of God, I have, of his commission to the people of Israel, to the nation. Um, and that could be so. I think uh, chapter 1 does say while Uzziah was alive that Isaiah began his ministry, and this clearly takes place of when he died. Uh, so I don't believe that. I think this is actually a, a, a different calling that Isaiah had previously. This is a more of a directional calling um, where they wouldn't hear his first calling. And now God's saying, okay, now this is what I want you to say. Uh, either way, the message remains the same. And uh, I don't want to get hung up on, on the details there. But let me tell you a little bit about the time of this takes place. It says in the year Uzziah died. Now, King Uzziah was the 10th king of Judah, which is the southern kingdom. If you remember, if you could recall, you know, David was the first king, or really Saul, uh, David, and then his, David's son, Solomon. After that, the kingdom split into two. You had the northern king of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And then they had two kings, right? One in the north and one in the south, right? So King Uzziah was the 10th king of Judah. And... Consequently, he was the last good king that they had ever had. If you read his story, this is in 2 Kings uh, and Chronicles, you can read. uh, He 
brought them back to God in many ways. He did a lot of great works. He, it was said that he was the most prosperous king, or he made the nation the most prosperous since Solomon. Okay, this was a, a godly man, a godly king who brought the people back to God. But he had a downfall towards the end of his life. What he ended up doing was really the priestly duties. And that was something that really that Saul did in the beginning. Right? He, he did something that was dedicated strictly to the priest, and then the king took on those responsibilities. What did that mean? Why was that such a great offense? It's because there's only one king and priest. Is Jesus, Jesus Christ. Now, it's, it's interesting, if you just take a step back and look more of a historical perspective, it's very interesting when civilizations, all of them, they've always had a king-priest. All of them. If you think about, again, uh, Rome, exa for example, or, or Pharaoh, the, the church and, and, and the, the religion there and the state was always one. You always worshipped the pharaoh or, or, or the emperor or whatever. All, he was the ambassador for the gods. He was all this, except when it came to Christ. What did Christ say? Render to Caesars what is Caesars. Render to God what is God's. There is a separation there that Christ made. And this was revolutionary. But God intended that in the children with the, with the Israelites in, in the political way where you have the king and then you have the priest. And they're not to be mixed because there's only one king priest, which is Christ. That was what this was all about. And so Uzziah, as a good of a man he was, as good of a king he was, he confused the two. He became the king priest. And because of that, God struck him with leprosy. And he lived and the rest of his life and died separate from the kingdom. Ostracized from him because, because of obviously his leprosy. And that's how he died, and it was an unfortunate end. But again, this, he led the people into the most prosperous time since Solomon. And so you can imagine the setting, and, and this is where the, the setting is. You can imagine the setting where uh, the, our king fell, right? We, we, we lived in the most prosperous time. God blessed us because he says that if we obey him, he'll bless us. If we disobey him, he, you know, he'll bring judgment. And, and now look at what's around us. King Uzziah is dead. His sons, again, this was the last good king that they ever got. Everyone else, with maybe some dips, but everyone else until ultimate destruction. And so this is the setting. This is, this is the historical setting that this takes place in. And I would imagine the people were restless because now there's been a change in a regime, and it looks grim. It looks bleak. And it's interesting to note that, you know, it's kind of feels that way today. I couldn't help but notice as I'm studying this some parallels of being prosperous and then heading into the unknown, of something that looks grim and bleak. But where was Isaiah during this? Well, he found himself at the temple. That's where we all ought to be. And what did he find at the temple? I'm going to reread. The year King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. And the hem of his garment filled the temple. See, what Isaiah found there was God. He was sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. See, this is the holy God, King. See, the throne, him sitting on it, is meant to be understood as, as a king's throne. That, yeah, Josiah died. Uzziah died. But God is the king. God had every, he placed Josiah there. He placed the kings before him, and he's going to place the kings after him. He placed the nations where they are. He dictates that. He organizes that. He moves that. He is the king of kings, and he is on the throne, unshaken and unmoved. That's what Isaiah saw. He was at the temple. He saw that. Where do we find ourselves? And, and this is, is important because if we're not there, then where are we? What are we seeing? Is it this God king above all, high and lifted up? Or are we looking around us? Are we starting to get un unnerved? Are we starting to get 
scared. Because I believe that when we see God, when we're at his temple and we see God, there's going to be things that just burn away. Just gone. And we're going to see that right now. Uh, filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two of them covered his face. With two of them covered his feet. With two he flew. And he called to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And this is the second point. Is that God is the, king, the holy king of kings. High and lifted up above all. But he's also the holy king of glory. Now, Glory in, in the Hebrew, when you look at, do a word study on this, what it means is, or, or what it, the picture that it paints is that of, of weight. Uh, it's weighty. It's something that, that has pressure on it. So if you think of gravity, it's a, it's a good parallel. It says, Him, his glory fills the whole earth. What that is meant to be understood is, is as if it's gravity. It's weighty. It's heavy. That's what the glory means. It presses down. What Isaiah was pressed down with was God's glory. That's what made him fall. It's hard to, to move around today with that sen sense of mind because we struggle with two different things. We struggle being pressed down with circumstance. Right, we're, we're, and I was just talking to Teddy about this. You know, everyone's under the circumstances, and it's hard to to you know live differently like that because we have what I'll call just gravity of life. The gravity of life is always pressing down, but the glory of God is different because what that does is that pushes us to our knees. That's where that brings us. The glory of God brings us to our knees, and praise and worship with the right mind perspective where the gravity of life crushes us so where do you want to be as, as a christian do you want to be pressured by the gravity of life or be pressured by the glory of god because one of them will lift you up and one of them will crush you beneath like dust and that's where we have to walk as christians because we're all live in the world we're not supposed to be of it but we all live in it we all have lives we all have pressures we all have the gravity of life that we're walking in, but we don't have to walk under it. We don't. We can walk under the pressure of the glory of God, which brings us to our knees and ultimately lifts us up. And so that's what this, he says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Fill, the whole earth is full of his glory. Do we walk with that knowledge and that understanding? Or do we have to try to, you know, find God in things? Like, where is God now? Where, where, where is he during this situation? Where the whole earth is filled with his glory. That's a matter of fact as a Christian. And this is what true worship sounds like. This is what true worship is. These angels... Who is the focus here? It's on God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Among. The whole earth is filled with his glory. It all points back to him. And every song that we sung in our worship, what was the focus on? It was on God. That is what true worship is. We're worshiping God. And it's, it's sad to me to, to sing what are known as popular, quote, worship songs. And all of these popular hits on the radio, and all, the main focus is on me. The main focus is on what I want from God. Oh, I, you know, God loves me. Where's the, what's the subject? The subject is me, not God. God loves me. God, I want this from God. I want that from God. Or, you know, and the entire focus of these quote-unquote worship songs is about on me. That's not worship. That's selfishness that we're singing in the temple of God. They're saying, God, I know you're the king, king of glory, you're the king of kings, but this is what I want you to do. How ridiculous is that? And yet, it's just played all the time. And yet, what true worship is, is when God is the center, when we're worshiping him for who he is. The holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with your glory. That is what worship sounds like, and that is what he deserves. 
That is what he requires because he is God. And remember what I said before, holiness is purely an attribute of God and God alone. And that is why we worship him. That's what separates him from everything else. He is creator God. He is separate from his creation. That's what that holiness is. He is the most holy. Okay? And so these angels, these seraphim, are, are, are around him, worshiping and praising him in true worship and true praise. And then what is Isaiah's response to that? He says, uh, we'll pick up in verse 4, And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, that, that the seraphim who said, Holy, holy, holy. The, the, the foundations shook, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. That was his response. <laughs> Terror, fear. That was his response because of seeing this holy and glory being pressured by his glory being confronted with his unfiltered holiness. Everything around him is shaking. If smoke is filling up, he says, woe is me, because he knew in that moment that he was helpless, that there was no defense that he could make for himself. There's no grounds in which he could stand on before a holy God. He says, for I am lost, which is meant to be interpreted uh, literally to to cease, or to cause to cease, uh, to be cut off, destroyed, perish. He says, woe is me, for I am, I am perished. I'm going to perish. I can't stand to be before this holy God full of glory. He says, woe is me, I, for I am lost. Uh, <clears throat> for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amidst a people of unclean lips. See, what grounds did Isaiah have to stand on? How could Isaiah defend himself before this holy God? What argument could Isaiah make on his own behalf before this God? See, before God's holiness, before his glory, everything, everything is consumed. Everything burns up. But look at this. There's a little twist to this. It says, I'm a man of impure or unclean lips amongst the people of impure or unclean lips. I, Isaiah saw that God and God alone was holy, and, and he was not. But he wasn't consumed by God's fiery holiness. Even though he was a man of unclean lips, he himself was not consumed. What was consumed? When the angel put the coal to his mouth. He didn't burn. It was his sin. It was the impurity. It was the uncleansliness that God took away. That's what the coal burned. See, when God judges his people, and this is a point we'll get to more later, but when God judges his people, it's not for damnation. It's for purification. If you can think of how they, they purify gold, what they do is they put the, the material, the metals, in a, a furnace, they turn the furnace up to thousands of degrees. And what happens is the impurities bubble up and then fizzle out. And so what happens is when the gold is pure, when it's pure gold, there's no impurities left because the fire was so hot that it burnt it all out. And so the, the blacksmith or, or the welder, he can look at this, this gold and see a clear reflection of himself in that. And so that's what this coal was doing. The coal touched Isaiah's lips, and it didn't burn him, but it burnt the impurities out of him. So this brings up a, a very important point for today, and that's really, there is no man that can stand before God. It sounds simple enough, obvious enough. There's no man to stand before God. That angel makes every man cowards. But it's interesting to know that and today particularly, and, and maybe in past as well, but I can only I have eyes for today, that the understanding of we can perfect ourselves is, is a big thing now. The idea that, that me as a sinner can perfect my human nature, that, that is a prominent understanding, maybe not so much in the church, but in the world. We want to perfect human nature. And we could go about different ways, but I, I don't want to get too bogged up in that because it's not the focus. But the idea is that my human nature, scripturally speaking, is incurable. 
when I stand before God, there's, no, there's nothing good in me. See, that human nature that we inherit from Adam is entirely corrupt, it's entirely impure, and there's no fixing it. You can't make that better. It's a starless night. That's how dark it is. And there's nothing that we can do to our human nature to make that even an ounce brighter. It's completely desolate and waste. Now it brings up the question, well, what about the Christian? What, is, what does that look like? Well, by the grace of God, Christ, through Christ, through his work on the cross, through our faith and obedience in him, he gives us a new nature, not born of Adam, but born of Christ. So now the Christian has two natures within them. They have the sinful, dark nature that we've inherited from Adam, and now the Christian has the nature that we've inherited from Christ. That is, as holy as Christ is holy, as God is holy, that dwells in us. It's what we call the Holy Spirit. It's that nature that we're born again. That's what the term is referred to. We're born in a new line, not in the Adam, but in the new Adam, Christ. That's what Paul says in, in Isaiah, I mean, uh, so Paul says in uh, Romans 5. Is their, their old Adam, sin and death, entered in, and then the new Adam uh, is life. And, and is these two natures, so Paul struggles, says, man, the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. The things I do want to do, I end up not doing. Who will save me from this wretched flesh? Because he understood that there's nothing redeemable in my flesh. It is only Christ, and only through his spirit. He says, walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. We have to battle now as a Christian that we constantly have to fight. And it's not to say that someone who is without Christ can't do good things. It's not what I'm saying. No more than, than a, a, a wolf can provide for its pups. It doesn't change the fact that it, it's still a, a wolf. right? It doesn't change its nature, even though it can do a good thing. It's saying the very nature of man is wicked. And this is what Isaiah is confronted with. He says, I'm a man of unclean. If there's nothing good in me, I'm amongst a people of unclean lips. Woe is me. I'm going to burn in front of this holy and glorious God. But that's not what happens. He says, the seraphim, this, after this confession, acknowledgement of this holy God, one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sins atoned for. And so now we are introduced to this holy king of salvation. See, Isaiah confesses before this God. I have nothing to stand. I have no arguments. I have nothing to fight for me. And I'm going to be burnt up. I'm going to be consumed by him. And in the midst of that, this living, burning coal touches Isaiah's lips. And he himself is not consumed, but his sin. And this is what's powerful. This is what makes the gospel the good news. And one of the side effects out of many, one of the, the downsides of removing God from his holiness is you remove God, you remove this, this aspect of our forgiveness from God. Because like I, as I was stating before, when we bring God down to our level, we remove him of his holiness. What is forgiveness really then? See, God, see Isaiah fell down to his face in pleading with God. <laughs> Say, I'm a man of unclean lips. Because of his holiness, because of God's glory, because he was confronted by that, it compelled him. It forced him to see himself as he, as, as he really is. A sinful man. And yet when we, and, 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 and his, I'm sorry, he saw himself as a sinful man and that he was in the presence of a holy God that he needed judgment. That's, that, that's what happened. He saw that I, there's, I'm going to be judged for this. And yet by the grace of God, God took away his sin. He touched his mouth with coal and burned up his sin. And that's what compelled Isaiah to be a faithful servant, obedient servant, uh, a loving servant of God, is because he knew what he's been forgiven of. He stood in the presence of God, the holy God. And because he was forgiven by that holy God, that set the rest of his life 
He says, I'm going to be full on for this whole, for this King of Kings and Lord of Lords because I was forgiven when I should have been consumed. So now if, if we have this understanding of God uh, as purely our friend, as purely our, our buddy or our father figure, someone we can talk to, what does that forgiveness really mean? You know, I forgive my friend but, you know, for, for wrong, wronging me, but he's not falling on his face over it. He's not say, weeping and gnashing his teeth over an offense that he did to me. You know why? Because I'm not holy. I have no glory. God does. But when we treat God like purely that, we can walk around in sin and be okay. We can walk around as men of unclean lips, amongst a nation of unclean lips, and be okay simply for the fact that we don't know who God is, simply for the fact that we don't know holiness. And that's a travesty. That truly is. There could be people in the pews sitting, listening to service, and never encounter a holy God and be okay to live a sinful life. I pray that never be so here, uh, and I pray that never be so with us. But it does require us to know who the God that we pray to really is. What ways are we walking in? Okay, Because this scenario led Isaiah to be obedient to his commission, which brings us to what was the task God had for Isaiah. We'll pick this up um, in verse 8. Yes, verse, verse 8. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then, the, then I said, here I am, send me. Let's stop there for a sec. So this is God's, the holy God, and this is his holy commission. This is holy work that he's requiring Isaiah to do. The first thing that he does is he opens up the invitation. He says, who will, I, who will go for us? Who can I send? God is still asking that question. Though not to Isaiah, but to us, to you, to me. God's work still isn't done until he comes again. There's still work to be done. And he's saying, who can I send? Who will go? Who will take the coal that I have and who will allow me to burn that sin out of their lives so that I can cleanse their lips and then use their lips for my holy work? Because that's exactly what Isaiah did. Isaiah was a prophet, right? He said he's a man of unclean lips. That was the exact thing that God purified so he could go out and speak. And God's asking us, who can I send? Who will be obedient to me? Who will speak the words that I put in their mouth? Notice Isaiah's response without even asking, well, what do you want me to do? Isaiah didn't ask that. Isaiah says, here I am, send me. See, I think sometimes, myself included, like I'll follow the Lord as long as it's where I want to go. <laughs> the Lord wants me to do something that's pretty comfortable, I'll do it. And we'll kind of play this negotiating game with God, where he's like, who can I go send me? Where? Where to? And I can choose whether I want to be obedient to that or not. Where do, where do you want me to send it? There, that's a little uncomfortable. You want to send me over there? That's great. But Isaiah said, send me. I don't... He, God didn't even tell him what to do, how to do it, or anything like that. He says, who will I go, who can I send? And Isaiah immediately said, I will go send me. doesn't matter where, doesn't matter who, doesn't matter what. Send me, I'll go. That is powerful. That statement alone, saying, God, you, I'm up for whatever you want to do because you are the holy God. I am your servant. I'll go, you say where, and I'll be there. You say what, and I'll say it. Send me, I'll go. This is the attitude that we really have to, are compelled to adopt as servants of God. There's no negotiating. He is God. He says what to do. We say, yes, Lord. That's the way it's supposed to work. Perhaps when we've lost the understanding of God's holiness, perhaps that now we can negotiate with this God. Perhaps when we lost the sight of, of his holy. Uh, glorious God, now we have an understanding of now, okay, I could choose to listen or choose to not listen because, you know, granted, you know, we 
treat our friends the same way. We treat people that we are in our family the same way. You know, take out the trash, okay. And then we just, you know, forget, don't do it, don't jump on it, don't whatever. Or, you know, we hang out with friends, hey, be here at this time. It's like, okay, and we never show up or whatever. We, we treat things loosely. And then when we remove the holiness of God from who he is, we can do the same thing with him. And so in our relationship to God, every day, God calls us, hey, speak, speak my truth to this coworker. Uh, it makes me a little uncomfortable, God, you know, I'm not going to do that, actually. Uh, hey, pray for this situation. This person, you know, be on your knees and pray for them. Well, I, you know, have things that I want to watch. I have things I want to do. I'm kind of busy. I don't really want to do that. And we pray this negotiating with God, even though he is a holy God and glorious God. We, we remove that from him, from our daily life. And again, it's hurt us and it's crippled us as a church and as believers because we lost sight of who he was, who he is. So God opens the invitation. He says, who shall I send? Who will go for us? And, and he says, send me, I'll go. Notice that, and, and this is an, an important point, if you study some of the great prayers of the scriptures, every prayer is met with an action. I guess the, the quintessential example of this would be in Nehemiah, if you've ever read Nehemiah. The first chapter or two of Nehemiah, Nehemiah prays. So in the setting, this takes place after this event. So after Isaiah, Assyria comes, destroys Israel. Babylon comes, finishes the work. And so Israel and Judah are left desolate, just like God says is going to happen. Prophecy is fulfilled. And so Nehemiah is a captive uh, from after this time, and, and he's in Persia to the Persian king. And he gets word from the remnant that's in living in the desolate Israel, right? How, what are my brothers like there? What's happening there? And the news he gets is, well, they're constantly attacked. They're constantly berated. They're constantly being forced to defend themselves. It, it doesn't look good. This causes Nehemiah to weep bitterly for months and pray to God. And one of his prayers are recorded in that. And he's praying, he's uh, confessing his sins. He, just like Isaiah, Lord, forgive me for my sins. Forgive our people for our sins. Please help rebuild the wall. Please send, send somebody to, to redo, rebuild it and protect our people again. That was Nehemiah's prayer. Who did God send to do that work? It was Nehemiah. Right? And we see this model where someone prays to God, said, Lord, please do this. And then God sends that person to be the answer to their prayer. That's how prayer works. That's what's exciting about it. And this is modeled in the Gospels when Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So pray to God to send more laborers to the field. And then there's a chapter break, which is really unfortunate because a lot of times we lose the, the flow of it. But right after he says that, pray to God to send out more laborers for the harvest. Right after that, God sends out them. Right? That's the very next thing that happens. Pray to God to send out more. So go, two by two. And he goes, send, preaching repentance and paving the way for, for me. And God sends them. So they are the answer to their own prayers. And it, it, it's unfortunate to me, and, and it is irksome to me sometimes when I go to prayer meetings and, and, and I just hear prayers that are something like this. Lord, I, I pray for my coworker that you would save them. And even though that you put them in my life, even though you put me in their life, and even though we've been working together for 30 years, and even though, you know, all this stuff, I pray that you would send somebody somewhere to, to intervene in their life and save them. And I'm left sitting right next to them in prayer thinking, like, God put you there. God put you there for these many years for you to witness to this person. Right? Or, Lord, I, I pray for my neighbor. Uh, I pray that you would intervene in this person's life and, and you know, uh, save them. Even though I've been living next to them for 30 years.
change their heart and turn and heal. Then I said, how long? You know, and he said, until the city of Dry Lake comes out from how the, from how the people. And houses without people. And the land is in desolate, is, is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away. So the, the forsaken places are many in their midst. And the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tent remains in it, it will be burned again. For this people, this people's heart has grown dull, and with their eyes they can barely, I'm sorry, with their ears they can barely hear, and with their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. So it's important to understand that. What's the cause of this judgment? Because the language can be tricky. It could sound almost as if God is keeping them from repenting. That's not the case. That's not the judgment. The judgment is their heart has grown so dull, so calloused, so far from God, that they will not repent. Their ears have begun so dull, so unhearing, that they hear, but they don't listen. It's as if you're talking to someone who's, whose hands are on their ears. And say, ah, 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 like that's, that's what the state of these people were. They become so blind. Cataracts has just engulfed their eyes that they can't see. And that's the reason. It, it, the, Paul will put it as uh, searing the conscience. And if you think about, you know, ironing clothes, and if you accidentally put the iron on your hand, you sear your skin. And what happens is you can't feel anything anymore. It becomes as if you have, there's, not, there's no feeling there. That's what happened to these people's conscience. That's what happened to these people's hearts, is they've gone so far from God. They've seared their hearts. They don't feel anything anymore. They don't hear anything anymore. They don't see anything anymore. And what was the cure? The Assyrians. It was judgment. It was laying everything to waste. And there's hope at the end of this. We'll get to that in a second. But that was the judgment. That, those were the words Isaiah had to prophesy to the people. Imagine the outcry, the rage today if there was anything like that. If there was, a, if there was words of repentance today that we need to. If there was words of, of God's wrath today. How would people react to that today? I would imagine a lot like they did in Isaiah's time. Either mockery, hatred, vitriol. And yet, God called Isaiah to preach this message to this people. And Isaiah was obedient through and through to that. It's pretty phenomenal. Because, I mean, we as, as just being people, we like to be liked. That's just what we, how we are. Everyone's like, we all like to be liked. We like people that like us. And we kind of avoid people that don't. That's just the way we are. That's our human nature. The Bible is clear, though, when it says that if you want to be friends with the world, you make yourself to be enemies of God. And so Isaiah had a very tough message that he was commissioned to speak, but that didn't stop him from speaking it because he knew who he served. He was the holy king of kings, the holy king of glory. And so I, I think that 
Let's go on a quick aside. Uh, the, the main theme, again, is, is God being a holy God. I think that a lot of our problems in our lives, or a lot of the reasons why we can't surrender certain things, a lot of the reasons why we still worship other idols, a lot of the reasons why we as Christians, as people who are saved by grace, because remember, when we adopt that, that, that new nature from Christ, we still have the old nature. That's why you have Christians who are saved by grace who are still sinning, right? because we, we battle with those two natures. But that's why I, I believe it's, it, it's hard or challenging for us Christians to live that fully surrendered life is because we don't understand holiness like Isaiah did. All right, so, so again, in Matthew 13, it says that because their hearts have grown so dull and ears, that these are the people that, that this is the message you have to speak to these people. And he says, for how long? And God says, until there's nothing left, basically, until there's just the seed of this great tree that's left. All is consumed by his holy wrath. But he ends, uh, I'll wrap this up, because he, he ends here with actually a note of hope. And I'm going to read it in another translation, because I think it speaks a little more clearly. I'm reading on the English Standard Version. Um, this, I think, is, is the uh, um, King James Version. And so in the very last verse, it reads like this in the King James Version. But yet in the, yet Oh, I'm sorry, but yet in it shall be a tenth. This is talking about after the judgment or, or during the judgment. And it shall return, and it shall be eaten as a teal tree. Uh, again, this says a uh, terebinth, uh, as, and as an oak, whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be a substance thereof. Now I'll explain what this means and why it's hopeful. What a terebinth tree is, is basically, it's almost like a pine tree, except when it's inclement weather, the leaves fall off, like an oak tree, right? When the leaves will fall off, and it will look as if it's dead. There's no life in it. But he says, the holy seed shall be its substance thereof, meaning that although that it would appear to be lifeless, desolate, on the outward appearance, before all the nations, Israel has fallen, Judah has fallen, they're gone. If everyone can see it's a tree with no leaves on it. It looks dead. It shall be, the seed will remain and it will grow again. It's not for its destruction, but it's for purification. Because what do we know happens? I mentioned it in Nehemiah, but also in Ezekiel. What happens is they return and they rededicate themselves to God. And it's a fantastic, encouraging story. I, I, I really encourage you guys to read the conclusion to this because this can sound so weighty because it is so weighty. It's judgment. But there's hope at the end. It says, when I bring you back, you will rededicate yourselves to me. The Holy See will remain. The substance that lies within it and it will remain and you will become my people again. You will hear my voice again. And that's what happens. So, uh, in closing, this is just as more of a, a reflection um, but I do believe that, that God is going to do a great work again. I believe this with all my heart, that God is going to be uh, revealing himself to his people again. And there will be a great awakening again within his people, within his body. It might not look like anything we think it might look like. But in the meantime, what is going to be consumed by his holiness? What will be consumed by his, the weight of his glory? And in a way of reflection, I really want us to think, whoever is hearing this, are we like Isaiah or are we like the people of Israel? They both got consumed. Isaiah's sin got consumed by the fire of God's holiness and the weight of his glory. At the same time, and that same holy God all of Israel got consumed by the fire of his holiness and the weight of his glory. I'm going to just read it. This is a poem that, that I had for like almost a decade now that I, I, I keep in my Bible and I look to it every now and again. And I'll read it to you because I think it puts things in perspective. And it's not to determine our eternal destination. That's not my job. That's not your job. That's God and God's alone. But it is to give us an idea 
of where we stand, on what we can work on, and what we need to uproot in our lives. But this is the way the poem goes. I don't know who wrote it. it it's uh, anonymous from as far as I researched. But it goes like this. This is from God's perspective. You call me eternal, then you do not seek me. You call me fair, then you do not love me. You call me gracious, then you do not trust me. You call me just, then you do not fear me. You call me life, then you do not choose me. You call me light, then you do not see me. You call me Lord, and you do not respect me. You call me master, but you do not obey me. You call me merciful, but you don't thank me. You call me mighty, but you don't honor me. You call me noble, but you don't serve me. And you call me rich, but you don't ask me. You call me savior, but you don't praise me. You call me shepherd, but you don't follow me. You call me the way, but you don't walk in me. You call me wise, but you don't heed me. You call me son of God, then you not worship me. So when I sentence you, you do not blame me. And these are powerful words. It's a powerful poem. And, and it's worth meditating over on, on what our relationship with God is like. Because yes, he is our father. Absolutely. Jesus says, Abba, Father. That is, that is who he is. And yes, he is our friend. But m so much more than that, he is a holy God whose the whole earth is filled with his glory. And he demands our obedience because he is God. And if we can have an understanding of that, I don't think that there's anything in this life that's going to hold you back from, from doing his will, from living his life, and from moving forward in him and really changing. Imagine a church filled with Isaiahs. Imagine what that would look like. I personally, I can't imagine that. I don't know what that would look like. But, but just imagine everyone in, in this congregation who understands that we serve a holy God, who knows that and who lives that, and who's obedient to that. What could that look like? Well, I think that could change a nation. I think that could, it could change the world. And let's pray. Bless these people, Lord.